This podcast is part of the Game and Entertainment Network. Visit tgenetwork.net to find the latest episodes from all our shows. Welcome back to Couch Potatoes. This is episode number 94. Uh, somehow or another, the first couple minutes of our recording got cut off, but this week we have, uh, tactics back on the show. We're talking about, uh, regions and regional servers and gaming and how that affects culture and other things within the gaming sphere. Uh, anyhow, um, we jump into our discussion about what we've been playing. Uh, it cut off a little bit of what tactics started with, but we'll pick up right about here. It was kind of nice. There's always a bigger fish kind of thing. But yeah. I think I'm seeing that that's definitely where the game is going to shine the most is that sort of strategy and competition at that level. Because minor advantage is you have to snowball or you just stalemate or you, you get exhausted or you don't have people around who are able to stay online for three hours straight. So you start losing people and then you lose from attrition. Got um, it. It's a different kind of PvP than the focus on we have to finish this in the next 20 minutes or else we all didn't have fun. Right. It's a longer longer battle. Yes, much longer and much much more involved. You can always you know, turn the corner. You actually that sounds have a lot like World v. World in Guild Wars 2, though. I mean, it's conceptually from – it yes, sounds similar. The thing is that unlike Guild Wars 2 where you could just bring as many bodies as possible and – throw down the rams and smash through. You can't do that. <laughs> Black Desert, it just doesn't work. Um, yes, you can bring a big, huge Zerg, and generally, if you can bring an overwhelming Zerg on the enemy, you'll win. But that's only if it's an overwhelming Zerg. A slight numerical advantage? Nope. We were about even numbers, and neither of us had a long-term advantage on the other. Well, that's good. That means it's more skill-based and strategy-based than mm-hmm. pure Zerg. I'm just glad I finally got decent at PvP. Other than the three hopelessly overgeared people, I was trashing a lot of folks. <laughs> it's like, oh, you want to ca- you want to cast that spell? A, you missed me. B, you're on the ground. And C, I'm keeping you there for the next six seconds. Have fun. See, that's shitty. I I don't know. That's why I didn't like it. It was too much. Gear difference is making a huge difference. And I didn't have 100 hours to grind shit. Well, levels I, of gear. Shush! Levels well, of gear. What I was describing to you has nothing to do with gear. It was purely skill. Like, I would block the skill, close uh, distance, and smash them up. Uh, would I actually uh, kill them? No. But <laughs> somebody else could kill them as I locked them down very effectively. Gear doesn't make as much of a difference if you make lots of skill errors. Well, that's that's good because that's always my biggest complaint is gear making all the difference. It makes a difference, but not a major one. If some it, like I.e. Uh, someone with higher skill level and lower gear score should still theoretically beat someone with lower skill level and higher gear score. Mm-hmm. And if that's um, the case, then that's at least semi well balanced, in my opinion. And I've actually been doing some dueling against a wizard, and my class of Valkyrie is. Supposed to lose by slow attrition to a wizard. And even though our gear scores are just about the same, I'm steadily getting them closer and closer to death each time we fight. Well, that's good. So you're so, improving. Skill does make a difference. It's just a lot of people... It, it's hard to see the skill at first blush. I thought it was, oh my gosh, I'm getting out of gear. It's like, no, it's because I suck and I need to learn to get better. Well, that is the attitude that most people in competitive games need. Uh, however, it's not the attitude that most people have, hence toxicity and so on and so forth. Uh, so, have you played anything else? Uh, that's... I mean, a couple of games of League of Legends here and there. I see yeah. Curse not flying, because I will play my support mind out, and it all falls to crap at some point or another. It's like, I can't even do anything anymore. Like, how would that all fall apart? I've had, like, three straight games that way. Yeah, I had a game uh, a couple weeks ago. I haven't played it in a couple weeks at least. And I was Twitch. I got a pentakill, my first like pentakill and ranked ever, and was like hyper carrying the whole thing. But my team could just not get coordinated. I was trying to shot call at the same time, and you know, it just it didn't work. It's bronze. What do you expect? <laughs> 
good times. Still lost. Got a Penta though. So only in bronze will you get a Penta in a game and still lose. <laughs> no shit. No shit. Uh, Ari, what what have you been playing? Finishing up Rise of the Tomb Raider, and I did finish it. Got all the way through the story and everything, and even done. I've done all the um, tombs now as well. It's a good game. I really enjoyed it at the end. It really kind of focused itself on what it wanted to do, which was the story. So yeah, and some really good set pieces at the end there too. Amazing set pieces. So you were comparing it to Uncharted 4 the other day. Um, yeah. Would you say that Uncharted 4 is still better like yes. narratively? Yes. Yeah? And gameplay-wise as well, I think. Mm. Although at the I end, I felt like Tomb Raider <laughs> did pick up its game a lot. With both the strategy required, the different guns you're using and all that kind of stuff, it was more focused on the combat rather than the progression sort of side of it, which was good. And like I said, the story just can't, like, it pushed itself forward a bit more towards it. So, yeah, it was, it was definitely a far better ending than the beginning part. And I played some Secret World. Not really much yet, I'm just getting my build in order because I want to play that again and actually get You've through played some played it in the past? Yeah, yeah, I've got a max level character. But yeah, no, yeah, um, I max level character before, but I didn't get good like dungeon gear. So I've still got that, and I've got quite a few AP points, which is all those skills and stuff. But I think I need to do a little bit more and get a little bit more points and figure out a better build because mine was just shitty. That's still like that's one of the only MMOs that's out there that's semi popular that I haven't tried yet. And I know that it looks cool. It appeals to me in a lot of ways, but I just am afraid that if I even bother spending the money, I'm going to feel like I, you know, I, I threw my money away. It's like ten bucks to actually get the game, you know. Well, I remember, yeah, but there was all those issues and shit. So, I mean, I guess just pay the ten bucks and whatever. Yeah, yeah. But. And um, you can buy like a really cheap sort of global pack now, and you get every single sync like DLC bit, which is like okay. twenty DLCs now. So yeah, that's what about, I was. You can get all that for like thirty, forty bucks. Right, but 30 or 40 bucks spent on something Actually, that I don't have. I was going to get that DLC pack and it gives you an extra copy. So you can have the extra copy. Excellent. Excellent. So, yeah, that's Excellent. all I've been doing this week. I'm trying to figure out what like indie game I want to play next to because there's that one called Inside. It's like that new um, like limbo style game, but it's got really good like review scores and everything. So that looks good. You know me, I need new stuff. New stuff. The newest indie game that I've been playing, I talked about it a little bit before, was uh, Crashlands. I think you would really like that one. Um, I, you know, I didn't really play Don't Starve all that much, but it's it's definitely one of those games that was uh, compared very heavily. But I didn't play enough Don't Starve to really know how they compare. They just feel very similar aesthetically and gameplay wise because you just run around hacking this stuff down get, to get it. Uh, you know ingredients like i found some cool stuff though like as you're killing things eventually you get like new schematics to make new stuff so like one type of enemy ended up dropping this like hatch uh, or sorry it dropped an egg and then you could actually go over and build this hatchery thing and then put the egg in it and then you created one of those um you hatch out one of those types of enemies and then it follows you around and actually is like your pet and will fight with you and stuff. It was kind of cool. And then you just get like rare drops. It has kind of like the Diablo or MMO thing where it's got like color coded drops and everything that you create is random. So say you create a breastplate uh, out of wood. The first time it comes out, it's just white. Well, then you could create it again and maybe get a purple or whatever. And so that kind of changes the way your stats are and on-hit effects and stuff. But it's it's like you don't really micromanage it. Is really. it still early access or is it actually released? I believe it's already released. Oh, wow. I'm surprised I didn't see it. <laughs> uh, I just know it was like one of those things that popped up in a queue. And I saw it and was like, eh, this looks kind of cool. I know I watched a YouTube person playing it and that looked pretty cool. But yeah, I never actually thought of picking it up. Looks good. I mean, like I said, if you played a lot of Don't Starve, it might be too similar. But I didn't play a lot of Don't Starve, so it was different enough that I've enjoyed it. Uh, and then, you know, there's like the the thing about it, too, is that you don't die. So in Don't Starve, I know if you got super far and then you died, it, you had to start over, didn't you? So in this one, if you die, it's just like you leave like a little uh, headstone there. And it'll show you where it is on the map. So then when you respawn, you just have to go back to that area, find it, and anything that you were carrying at that point drops. Not your gear, but just like stuff you had harvested like before the last time you saved or something. So it drops and you just go pick it up. No big deal. But it's pretty fun. Uh, the one thing I wish it had is like multiplayer or you know, something like that. Yeah, which I know like they, they did that with 
Well, they did that with Don't Starve, so maybe this that'll happen eventually, but up to this point, it has not. Oh, speaking of multiplayer, um, Starbound is actually going to release date now on the 26th. Yeah, I saw that. I haven't actually played that one, but it, it did look interesting. Yes, you have to get it. Uh, I, already got it. A, I got it like years ago. <laughs> yeah, know, yeah I was going to say it was around a long time ago. But, but it's very similar to Terraria. a server up and running for it, which might be cool. Definitely. Um, and then the only other game I've been playing is uh, Dragon Age Inquisition. Um, as I had said the other day, I uh, finished Doom, so I started up a new game. Um, that one, because I'm a fan of the series, I've played the other ones. Um Unfortunately, like one, the first two that I had on PS3, so you can't like import your save. However, you can do the whole thing where you um, go onto that, what's it called? The Keep, Dragon Age Keep. It's like a website. You go there, and then it gives you all of the different potential choices you could have made throughout both of the first two games. So then you can go through and actually, if you remember what you picked, which I remember on my main playthrough... Uh, which choices I had made. So I went through and clicked through all of them, set everything up that way, and then that actually is supposed to impact the story of the game. Because uh, depending on who you pick, some other people died, yada yada. And there's already been some reoccurring characters from the older games, so that's kind of cool. It's got the con- continuity, but then also is a whole new story because you end up creating a whole new character that's completely unrelated to the characters you played in the other games. But yet, all of those choices and things affect like the history of it. So it's, it's really cool in the fact that they did that kind of thing. However, I haven't gotten far enough along to really judge how much that affects things. Either way, I ended up making a Canary because you've never been able to play those before. And I just said, well, I want to run around with horns on my head. So why not? Uh, But I did stick with uh, the rogue class because that was the one that I tend to play the most, but yeah, uh, I've gotten through, um, a little, I got a little ways into it, but not not super far. So far, I've enjoyed it. It's been pretty cool. But yeah, that that's about all I've been up to so far. So we can move. On. The overall idea is we're going to talk about the you know, the global gaming community. That's, I mean, we're talking on the internet from currently two continents and soon to be three. Uh, so, as considering regions, latency, and community, and all, all that kind of stuff. So, thinking about it as a pros and cons thing. I mean, obviously, the internet's global. Everybody can get on the internet. Otherwise, you would be listening to this. Well, not everybody, but you know what I mean. Uh, like nine-tenths of the yeah. world. The vast majority of the world will give it a little more time, and that will be everybody again. Except those guys in North Korea, poor, poor people. No, they have the internet. It's just every page is Kim Jong-il's face. <laughs> I, thought was, I, I thought it was the fattest man in North Korea, Kim Jong-un. <laughs> that one. Well, whatever, uh, Il was his father, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, whatever the case... Yeah. Ill's been dead for a bit now. <laughs> they, they don't get uh, internet the way we do. They won't be hearing this, unfortunately. Anyway, so that, that's a you know obviously a positive. We wouldn't even be talking about gaming and internet gaming if it wasn't a global or sort even of thing. Having this podcast or our blogging community or our gaming community or Twitter or blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. blah, blah. <laughs> so obviously that's the, a dub kind of positive of the global gaming community. It wouldn't be called such a thing. Or, you know, be mentioned as, oh, yeah, I got some friends over in Europe and in Australia and, you know, over in Japan. Like, that's kind of normal for a gamer these days. I think that has to be the best part of it, too. Like, oh, just yeah. meeting lots of different people with you know, similar interests that are just everywhere. And it's also, you know, learning more through them about different situations, different places, different Cultures. People. Yeah, cultures, ways of being and thinking. Being upside down. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Ari, how does it feel to always be standing on the ceiling? It's amazing, actually. You get a good view. <laughs> so, like, following on from that is like anyone can play with pretty much anyone, right? Uh, not not yet. It's still really weird because you have a lot of those regional restrictions for certain companies and games, you know, between, like, Eurocentric areas and 
North American servers. Like there was a weird thing with, um, I remember when um, Black Desert came out, like being from Australia, it wasn't even sure if we were even going to be able to play with any of you because we were getting lumped in with like Oceanic Asia kind of stuff, which is stupid, but that's what where we were. And that still happens to this day. And it really isn't still a global community. Like you still get a lot of random restrictions that happen, especially like Asian countries not being able to get into our games or like African countries. And yeah, there's that risk of like, you know, botters and hackers and all that kind of stuff, but it's still a restriction. And I, I know people from those areas and it, it does irritate them. Yeah, re reason restrictions are pretty much annoying. Like there's been, there's been two MMOs this year that were stuck in South Korea for, well, in one case, four years, in the other case, a year. And then they were ported over and the region restriction removed and all that. You know, Blade and Soul, Black Desert, um, love them or hate them kind of thing. But, you know, yeah, region restrictions are crummy because who's, why say you can't play this just because of where you live? Well, and that boils down to latency. No, there's still a lot of legal restrictions there. That too. I know there is, like, between where your publishing company is and where you're actually allowed to publish a game, a lot of those sort of restrictions come into place. Which is why in Europe they'll have, like, a separate, separate publisher that makes the same game. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of legal holes that they have to get through. But oh, outside of that, it's also <laughs> the huge issue of latency, especially in Twitch-based, or even just MMOs, anything, really, because uh, if you, like, you can attest from playing on North American servers, you get a horrific ping. And in the case of that, I mean, there's no way around that. And even if they put a server in Australia and you play on that server, then you're... Oh, God damn, those servers are amazing. Well, I played a WoW one for a little while. Actually, there was a Star Trek... Well, Star Trek... Star Wars. What? Not Star Wars. What's that one with the lightsabers and stuff? Star Wars. That's the one. Star Wars. <laughs> I suck at games. <laughs> yeah, they had an Aussie server, and it was amazing. Oh, my God. That's what it's actually like to play online games. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm amazed. But then you can't play with any of your friends. No. That's okay. I, w I would take 30 millisecond ping over friends. <laughs> <laughs> High five. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, like, to me, the last major positive is that, you know, since g games are going to kind of be regional, no matter what you do, um, you can adapt to the people who play there. And I... I hate to go back to the same example over and over again, but it's pertinent, so heck, why not? Uh, Korean grinder MMOs. Well, obviously, people in Korea like those, otherwise they wouldn't be made. <laughs> I, you adapt the game to the people who play, they're like, World of Warcraft getting increasingly casual over time to maintain their market share, um, however that may be. And you adapt to who's playing your game, and... Because cultures are different across the world, you're going to end up with regions adapting in different ways. And sometimes if you try to make an Uber game that is for everywhere, you satisfy even fewer people than you would have otherwise. Now, you can also look at it on the flip side, too, uh, that people, like, let's say, take any MMO that, well, WoW is probably the best example because there was the most servers. But there's, like, a shit ton of North American servers, right? But each one of them is, like, on a different time zone, essentially. So people can actually adapt to the region as well, because I've had friends that, like, say, we both lived together, like, back in my EQ2 days. Me and my one of my best friends lived together, and we both played the game, but I worked Swing Shift, and he worked Graveyard. So when I would get up in the morning, I'd play with, you know, people that were in our time zone or maybe in the eastern time zone that were still on our server that – you know, we're getting off work, I'd be playing with them during the day, and then I'd go to work, and when I'd get off, I'd play with people who were either night owls like myself or someone that was in a different area. And he did the opposite because he was on Graveyard. He would always play early in the morning when he first got home, so he'd be playing with people from Australia or wherever else just because of the fact that the time zones worked out better. That's when those people were on, so he got used to playing with, you know, different cultures and whatever within the same game, even on the same server. It's crazy. Yeah, uh, it actually happened to me when I was in Afghanistan. Uh, because of the time zone difference, it was difficult to stay in touch with people in the U.S. So it was like 9, 10, 11 hours away. Uh, it's kind of a con, but so I got really good friends with people in Europe. Right. Because <laughs> uh, right about their prime time was the exact same time I'd be playing. 
<laughs> yeah, that's how it works. Uh, so just switching gears at least to the immediate cons, um, you know, we've mentioned it a couple times, latency. There's this pesky thing called the speed of light. It doesn't go any faster. Uh, so even if we have perfect server infrastructure with zero delay between signals, which is impossible, uh, we will still have a limit on how far the server can be from you before it becomes laggy. And and that can be a, a very small move, because if you look at like the League of Legends North American servers, they were in, uh, I think, Washington, or they were at least Western Coast. And I'm West Coast, so I used to get something like 20 ping, mm-hmm. and then they moved them all to Chicago because they decided that was more central. And when they did that, my ping shot up Which to like true. 60, which isn't bad by any means, but it was oh, enough to notice a difference. babies. I know. <laughs> yeah, I was actually uh, like I'm on the in mountain time zone right now, so I was a uh, I think 43 ping. It was nice, and now it, and then when they moved to Chicago, initially 64. I think something rerouted because it's 90 all the time now, and I got fiber, good fiber. So it isn't me. Somebody's routing terribly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. La- latency, real deal. I mean, let's talk to the likely. Um, well. Perfect person for this. How's it going, Harry? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> well, one of the weird things is, like, a lot of companies still don't tunnel their games properly. If you know what tunneling is, it's like making sure there's the least amount of hops in between the client and the wow. game server. But so many games are just absolutely appalling at this, making weird pit stops around countries and towns and then reverting back and that kind of stuff so it often is better to get one of those like you know ping forwarding programs like what the fuck fast and all those kind of things because they actually have a more direct route and which brings your ping down to at least 200 sometimes Ooh, 200 yeah, i have never, never right? played a game at 200 ping ever never i don't even know how you play games at that ping like anything over, anything over 100 is like unresponsive garbage. It's one of those Bane things. I was born to it, molded by it. <laughs> oh, well, let's put it this way, Islain. Like, again, as in Afghanistan, my best ping playing on DNA servers was 500. You can't, that's not okay. even playable. That's like what, half? And half it would second. occasionally spike to. It would occasionally spike to literally 15,000, and I just would not see anything happen for 15 it's seconds. It's playable, but you have to be freaking good. You're like precog- yes, you're pre- like, pre- precognition yes. levels of like thinking ahead. Like, this enemy is going to do this in two seconds, so I better press it now. And that's how we play a game. It's ridiculous. Your mind yeah. actually takes over sometimes. It's it's actually kind of awesome because I came back from that and I and I ended up looking like a complete god of reflexes because I went from 500 plus ping to you know back to 40 ish. Uh, and it's like like a like, fucking religious experience right there. That's <laughs> not that bad, but like seriously, my gameplay improved drastically because I've been so used to having to predict what people are going to do next. I did predict what they did next and could actually react to it instead of being the only option to survive. Uh, it, was, it was really fun. Um, granted, it would... I suppose it's a case of, as Ari was saying, you get used to it even if you don't like it. Well, yeah, you do. Because, I mean, like I said, when they switched those servers over and my ping went up like 40 points, which isn't much, but it was enough to be like, oh, this is horrible. Uh, and then after a while, you just don't notice. It's not a big deal. See, this is where the problem with, like, action combat online games comes into play, especially MMOs. Like, you seem to feel the difference from that a lot more than you would think. And MMOs are doing this weird thing now where they're trying to be, like, um, letting the client, like, have a lot more information. Peer-to-peer. No, no, letting the client have a lot more information and then rechecking that on the server. The problem with that is... I've done something on my screen now. It looks good. I've pressed the right buttons and then it'll recalibrate with the server and then I come back and I'm dead. And I'm like, what? Like, yeah. And then I look at it. Like, this happens in Overwatch. Like, it <laughs> happens in Overwatch a lot too. Like, I know I got those first shots on that person or moved the specific way and then I'll see my death camp and I'm like, I didn't move at all. I didn't turn at all. Like, it's that kind of issue sometimes. Yeah, so latency is so much fun. Yes. Uh, especially if you want to be competitive or Twitch-based. 
or precise reactions to short tell PVE encounters. I don't see it getting any better though. That's the problem. It's, it's never going to be fast considering distance is always going to be an issue. Unless they figure out how to transfer it by like, you know, satellite waves like so fast slow. Or that's <laughs> no, 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 no. Here, here, I'm calling it now. We're going to figure out how to quantum entangle servers on opposite, opposite ends of the world. I mean, ah. the, there's going to be a way that they can do it. It's. We're not- I'm just saying, like, it, that works. They will figure out how to quantum entangle a server. Suddenly latency doesn't exist because all of your servers will just end up entangled. So light literally doesn't enter into the picture. There's no delay at all. Interesting. But that... That's a ways from now. Look up entanglement. It's trippy crazy. <laughs> now, let's bring quantum mechanics out of the discussion because we're talking about latency and what's here now. So, now, one um, other major con is that your regions can overly adapt to the people who play there. Aforementioned Korean grinder MMO. People say, like, why would I want to play this? All I have to do is grind for hours and hours and hours. So they have to differentiate themselves by either coming off of what they built the game for or otherwise adapting to the new region. You you pretty much have to undo what you did intentionally to suit one market to go to a different market. I mean, or they could just stop importing because we just don't like those types of games. True. But then they don't, you know, take a risk and try to expand and maybe become a success. I mean, like, WoW didn't know how well it was going to do in China until they tried, and then they blew up. Mm -hmm. So... Right, and you also have to consider that it's we're always complaining about how stale gaming is and how AAA publishing keeps on turning out the exact same game over and over again. But can you exactly blame them when somebody comes up with something a little bit different or imports something that's just not normal for the area, and everybody just craps on it and says, this, thing, this game sucks, why would I want to play this thing? It's like, well, you're the idiot who keeps on buying Call of Duty every year. <laughs> <laughs> so... You only have yourself to blame here, bro. Uh, so, Ari, I think you added a couple of negatives on the bottom here. Yeah, I was going to say, go on with that positive then. Like, speaking about different games and that kind of stuff, I actually think this global community is helping the game industry in that regards because you're getting a lot more, like, international and cross-national teams of people working on games. You know, it's not simply... A game development studio isn't simply just a physical thing anymore. You know what I mean? A one-stop place you know it's across boundaries it's across cities it's across countries all people working together to create you know better games in that regards i think like i see a lot of these companies working like that now i know the assassin's creed team were working cross nationally as well in their game for the recent one yeah well there's that and then imports where uh some of those you know um norwegian or your other european countries like somebody from there comes over here maybe they were kind of successful there with some game or whatever and then they come over here and join some other team and bring that influence it's not just that not even coming over now we're seeing a lot more imported games coming from different countries being made and then That's getting true. you know brought to australia we've always had a lot of those sort of asian games coming over but we're getting like different companies now bringing out games i remember this um like you said, Norwegian, I think it was, called Never Alone. Like a story about an Inuit family and that kind of stuff. All the history and the lore was put into that game. It was quite good, you know? And I think that's where the global industry is now. We're seeing a lot more games come out of it from different places and different people. There's also a lot more feedback, too. I mean, because if a, a game is, uh, you know, put out and it gets panned in one region it might not get panned in another because they think it's good or whatever but like yeah, other cultures that. are going like, to have different opinions games become absolute western hits yeah the, the term is uh, germans love david hasselhoff <laughs> yes. there's a reference to the fact for whatever reason germany loves that actor while the u.s could care less about him <laughs> that, that sort of idea what might appeal in one region doesn't in another exactly like the wow movie it's actually popular in asia who would have thought <laughs> It bombed here, though, didn't it? I mean, I remember oh, seeing... Oh, seriously it, bombed. <laughs> it, it, it didn't make anybody happy was the problem with it. It's because, <laughs> again, WoW was trying to make everyone happy. It makes me happy. <laughs> As a hater, it makes me happy anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just find it kind of silly that rather than try to say we want... And again, this is something that I will least appreciate about Black Desert, even if I don't like some aspects... 
they stick to their dang guns on the game they're trying to build instead of changing it to make people happy. They just refine what they got. How I wish more developers did that. Oh, I think it's yeah. they do take on feedback though, but it's 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 kind of that that hard line between knowing what feedback to take and when to step in the line and stick with your design principles. You know what I mean? Sometimes you might need to change things for a market or for your game to be good and fun and enjoyable, you know, but sometimes I think, especially with MMOs right now, you sometimes have to force in certain mechanics because they just work better in the long run. And I think that's most games sometimes. I'm more considering the cases where, you know, developers keep on trying to make the game do everything for everybody forever and ever. I'm in. Uh, no, that doesn't work. WoW got away with it because nobody else was doing everything. Oh, but even nowadays, when it released, it wasn't trying to do everything. You know? No, it, it steadily built into that after, what was it, Wrath of the Lich King? Or Cataclysm, they started doing everything. Uh, it was it was fairly it was fairly early on, but I mean, and, and you can't really say that nobody else was doing it, because EverQuest 2 was essentially the same fucking game. It just wasn't popular. Yeah, it was second. That, that's why EverQuest 2 wasn't as popular as second. Probably. <laughs> uh, so another negative I, we got down here is language barriers. Especially true in Europe and Asia, where there's a dozen languages plus in each region. I, sure, you can scoot onto, say, the Korean server. You won't be able to read a bit of it until you learn Korean. Yeah. I remember playing on um, one of these Final Fantasy XIV servers that was, like, Japanese. Because that was when we got the best ping on. Like, most Australians went there. But it was kind of weird seeing most of the chat running by in those kind of kanji characters. Kanji? Yeah, it's kanji, isn't it? Because you have no idea what it's saying. It was really quite, like, a weird experience. You're used to being the one kind of to see everything in your language, you know? And, yeah, seeing everything in indistinguishable kanji was different. Yeah, that, that's, that's definitely trippy. The only time I ever had that experience is when uh, League of Legends still had uh, the North American server. There was no South American server yet, and it was all one server. Um, and at that time, I remember, depending on the time of day that you were playing, or just, I don't know, sometimes you would get into a team where not a single person spoke English, except for you. And I'd be trying to <laughs> communicate, and there was no way. And it was just like, you would literally lose games because you couldn't communicate with your teammates. And you're just like, whatever, I'm just going to try and do my best, and hopefully you guys don't don't suck, because... <laughs> no, this is also in the days before Intelligent Pings. That too, yeah. <laughs> that, that made so much of a difference in my game, so even if I'm, I want to rage and I'm telling myself I'm not typing, I can still be helpful. Right. Uh, uh, thankfully, they ended up... You know, I can imagine you being the unhelpful kind of pinger, though, just pinging the same thing over and over again for like five minutes. Oh, he rages. Maybe? He rages. I've seen him do it. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, I don't just rage. I dismantle you. It's not incoherent, your mom sucks kind of crap. No, 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 no. It's, this is why you suck. <laughs> Which is why I don't like raging, because, you know, it's actual, it can actually hurt people. And I'm not aiming to do that it's at all. people like you are the reason uh, I don't play LOL. <laughs> no, actually, he's not bad. No, he's not he super bad. <laughs> I was just joking. Well, usually it was us on voice chat talking shit about people to each other and not actually telling them or just giving them like, hey, why don't you do this or do this instead of doing that? Because that's not working. So let's try something else. It was never really hurtful. But uh, yeah. <laughs> we've we've agreed yeah. that uh, yelling at each other on voice chat is better than actually being toxic in the game. Very, very true, uh, because it, it's a vent. Uh, emotions get very, very high in such a game where any mistake can cost you. I love that there are so many more co-op options now to play. Like, you know, when you're growing up, it's all those kind of LAN stuff or just a friend you know playing online or even just coming around your house and playing split screen, that kind of stuff. And yeah, they've kept all this co-op style games, but it's just great that there's a larger community now that you can play with. Like, there's so many great online games, and there's so many different servers for stuff now. Like, that's pretty damn cool. Well, yeah, I can say I, I loved that about um, once the consoles and uh, like caught up and got to the point where you could play online. Because there was games like Street Fighter for instance, that I remember playing the shit out of when I was younger because I had friends in school and whatever, and they'd come over and we'd all play Street Fighter or whatever. And it was fun, 
But outside of that, if you had nobody to come over to play with you, you could only play against a computer, and that sucks. Once they caught up uh, with console technology and got it to the point where they could go online, there was matchmaking, all that stuff, like newer iterations, uh, you know, you had that whole ability to just queue up and get match made with whoever. And it, it, of course, it tries to keep you with somebody that's nearby, but if they're not there, then it'll go farther and farther. So ping becomes an issue and all of that too, but it's still cool to be able to just queue up Definitely. and play with There's people. so many great games now that come out because of that, I think. Like, I think of Vermintide. That wouldn't have happened if we didn't have the technology and the global nature of games that we do now. Not unless it was, you know, couch co-op. Yeah, how about, let me flip it though. So many games are reliant on having online co-op that you can have a friend over and you can't play the game with them. That yeah. is true. Because there is no ability to split screen. There is no way for them to play the game right there with you. Like That's steadily gone out of games completely. Like I have Destiny here, Taken King and everything. And yeah, like sometimes I play it and that kind of stuff and people come over. But like it's a multiplayer game. Why can't I play with someone else on this game, you know? It used to piss me off with uh, my old roommate. We both had PS3s uh, only because of the fact that if we want, ever wanted to play anything together, we both had to buy a copy. So it was just like, it just happened that way. But it's so stupid. It's like we both had to buy a console and we both have to buy copies of the game to play in the same house online together. It's like so ridiculous. People wonder why I prefer Rock Band if I'm going to do a party game. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Because that, like... Shoot, they even lost Rock Band 4 without online play. <laughs> I mean, sure, some people raged, but I was like, cool, less things in my way, let's bring some friends over. <laughs> uh, so final negative here is time differences. I will say from personal experience that most everybody in the United States does not understand what a time zone is. Is he does now. He's actually gotten pretty damn good. You can just like go off on the fly what my time is now. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> True, but the thing is that I threw UTC plus nine at him, not even yesterday, and he just blanked. Well, yeah, because I don't have them all memorized. I just know some of them. Yeah, but plus nine, you can figure it out from that. Oh, my God. Yeah, do you even know you're a negative seven, bro? Okay. Cool. I, I didn't know. I didn't know that. Yeah, I don't use Pacific that. time zone is negative seven right now. It'll be negative eight when we're on plus standard time. Plus ten. Hour, time that is. Yep, she's plus ten. I will be plus nine. So we'll be next to each other pretty much. I mean, I understand how it works. I just don't have them all memorized. You mean you haven't figured out math yet? That's what you mean. You haven't figured out math. That's like math basic sucks. plus minus math. No, I know. What is it? Zero is London, right? Yep. Effectively, technically Greenwich. Which, you know, when's the last time London was the center of the world? Um, at the turn of the last century. <laughs> Not that long ago in consideration of human history. I know, I just find it pretty easy sometimes. But yeah, Americans don't understand a lot of that time stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, time differences. Not just some people don't understand time zones, so it's difficult to communicate with them. Like, oh yeah, it's going to be 9 p.m. tonight. What time zone, huh? I was like, are you serious? <laughs> Did you stop to think that maybe not everybody's on the East Coast or the West Coast? I actually like Or in Central Europe. They're trying to make like an international time now, online time. If that makes sense? I forgot which um, plus or UTC it's based on, but yeah, they're trying to, yeah, like some universal time zone one. So that'll be easier. The military uses it, is that they call it Zulu, and it's literally Greenwich Mean Time unadjusted for daylight savings. At all times. So, I mean, we've been using Zulu for decades. There was another thing, too, where they were saying that, uh, at least in California, they might stop using the uh, daylight savings. I'm hoping that maybe they just get rid of it all together, because it's kind of pointless. <clears throat> Me, too. It, it's a complete waste of yeah. time. And it just means we're, we're very difficult to understand. Like, Arizona has the right of it. Yeah. They don't even bother. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they don't well, even bother. The problem with daylight savings is... Outside of your country, people probably don't know about it. You know what I mean? So, like, for this, like, I think it was the last podcast, I was saying, oh, yeah, you're plus six, and I'd figured out that time in my head. Like, that's when you were going to be online. But I obviously didn't know about your daylight saving, so I was an hour off. Right. It's that kind of stuff that happens, too. Yeah. I was going to say the biggest problem with this time differences is a lot of these game companies don't take it into account. Like, I've had, like, Age of Wushu, this is the one I bring up quite a few times. 
they had this really cool like PvP like castle sieging kind of mechanic. Not really castle sieging, but going into the enemy karate dojos and messing them up and that kind of stuff. But the time was just unequivocally bad for anyone outside of America. So there was no real reason for me to play that game if I couldn't actually enjoy one of the main mechanics of it. It's that kind of issue that comes along. You know why? Why? Because America! Fuck, fuck yeah! yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like, Americans, even then, they put up... A lot of them put their, like, main times in Sunday. You know, American Sunday, that's when a lot of those big events kind of happen. But then that's shit. Like, have it on Saturday, and then everyone else in the world can wake up maybe early on Sunday, or sat- like Sunday or something, and play along, watch it, that kind of stuff. They've really got to start thinking about an international market rather than just a North American one. Or a European one. I've well, they have their own. Oh, yeah, just European a- too, but... They're only like they're around us for time zones, so like they're plus five, plus six. So even then, it's still pretty reasonable to make up a time that suits everyone if you're thinking about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was kind of funny though. Like, Node Wars start at 9 p.m. Eastern, and we had people complaining, "Why does it start so late?" And I'm thinking, because 6 p.m. Pacific is right about when the West Coast would even be able to get online. If we started at 6 p.m. your time, most of them would, on the West Coast would still be working. You myopic management. Yeah, I have noticed, though, that a lot of companies, and on the flip side of that, too, where North America gets screwed, uh, there's been a lot of companies that have like had their, you know, if it's a midnight launch or something, it's midnight launch uh, here, but then it's like, you know, whatever time elsewhere. Uh, in Europe or uh, across the world. And a lot of companies have been doing this where they've done like their launch or whatever it is, and it'll show like North America, Europe, Australia, blah, blah, blah. Like they'll give you all the different times. And a lot of the times it's like reasonable hours for Europe and Australia, but it's like midnight on a Tuesday for fucking America. So unless you're the kind of person that can stay <laughs> up past midnight, you're not going to play until the next day. So it, it kind of goes. Wait, wait, you mean you didn't take. You didn't take days off of work just to play this game for the first four days? Of the well, hour? I mean, some people what? do. Some people do. <laughs> I have never done that, but usually I can stay up till midnight anyway, so it's not an issue for me personally. But a lot of people don't have that luxury. Or it's like midnight. If it's midnight uh, Eastern time, then I'm golden. You know, 9 o'clock is great. And uh, that's happened with a lot of games where 9 o'clock p.m. I can start playing, and that's cool. But sometimes it's, you know two in the morning because they're launching it you know at 8 a.m in europe or whatever yeah sad but true I've, I've only stayed up and done the four day thing twice both of them were don't work when i was an adult and could afford to do that <laughs> yeah i did it for rift it was a while ago but rift but uh, anyways i think that pretty much covers the range anybody got any other pros and cons of the global gaming community no i think we covered pretty much everything i can think of but I think overall, it ends up being mostly positives, despite some negatives. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Because, hey, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't the exactly. thing. Exactly. And I, I can really appreciate that in more recent years, especially the older you get, you get smaller social circles and stuff. And so, like, this kind of expands upon that. Even though you don't see these people every day, you may not talk to them every single day. But having other friends that don't necessarily live down the street is, is pretty cool. And it also... Uh, helps expand your boundaries uh, as far as you know learning things culturally and you know all that good jazz. I think that about wraps up our show for this week. Uh, if you have questions, comments, you know what to do. Hit us up on the blogs, Twitter, wherever. Let us know what you think. And if you have any questions, shoot us a message. And we will see you guys in one week's time. Later. Uh, yes. Later. That does it for this week's edition of Couch Potatoes. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope that you'll continue to join us. Couch Potatoes can be found on Twitter at Couch Potatoes, and on Anook at Anook.com slash blog slash couch dash potatoes. Music credits, other places you can find us, and pertinent links discussed on the show can be found in the show notes. Thanks for listening. We're going to get back to gaming now, so we'll see you next week.